So this part of the class, we've already gone through discussion about the historical Buddha and Pabasambhava and some of the principles of Buddhism, the lineages within Tibet and so forth. And then we began looking at the teachings in terms of four different paths. The first one that we looked at and that we're still working with is the path of individual liberation. And then we'll move on from that to the path of the bodhisattva or altruistic intention. And then we'll move to the path of Tantra. And then finally we'll move to the path of Dzogchen. And so right now we're still in the path of individual liberation. Within each of the three paths we're talking about the three trainings. The three trainings begin with ethics. So we looked at the ethics of the path of individual liberation. And we looked at some of the meditations, including the two shamatha. First, we looked at just a stillness of body, speech, and mind as kind of a foundational practice. And then the one that we just did, which is looking at it in terms of the uh, focus on some small physical object. And so now we're going to talk about the wisdom aspect, the third of the three trainings. So we have ethics, meditation, and wisdom. But of course there are meditations associated with the wisdom part as well, so they kind of overlap a little bit with meditation per se. But I'm going to start by giving a short talk here on the wisdom from the point of view of the path of individual liberation. Now the historical Buddha, as we saw, was actually, as best we could tell, a very practical person. He didn't get lost in these grand kinds of arguments and discussions about things that no one for sure knows the answers to, the great metaphysical kinds of questions. In fact, he is said to have maintained a noble silence with respect to those kinds of questions, but instead was really focused on this life and what can we do in this life to make things better and enabling us in the context of a reincarnation to ensure that any next life that we may have is going to be better than this one and ultimately to stop that cycle of rebirth altogether and just to become totally in an enlightened state. And so one of the things that happened was that with the passing of the Buddha different opinions about all of this began to emerge. Not surprising, because that tends to happen with the passing of the founder of any religion. And so we see that kind of thing happening, and a number of different Indian schools developed as a part of this. And the most notable ones were the Shravakans, the Chittamatrans, and the uh, Madhyamakas, and those three schools were the, the principal ones. Now the Madhyamakas are broken down further, as we'll see here in just a moment, into uh, other designations within that. And so we're going to start with the first one, the Shravakans, and look at what it is that they understood as the Buddha's teachings on emptiness or on the wisdom aspect. And so basically they're talking about this idea of emptiness that the Buddha articulated in the second turning of the wheel. And it, in essence, another phrase we might use is transcendent wisdom, that it goes beyond our normal understanding of things, which is one of the key points of the Buddha, that we live in a state of ignorance, if you will, in understanding the real nature of the way things are. And that if we can get to a point where we have a true understanding of that nature, we will become enlightened. So that's the goal, is understanding that aspect of this idea of wisdom. And so uh, the idea, when we say transcendent wisdom, we just think about those words, you realize that that then means something that's beyond what we normally are able to say about it. It's transcendent. It transcends words, concepts, and ideas. So it makes it very difficult to discuss, although, as we all know, there are lots and lots of books in Buddhism about this, and many, many of the scholars have written about this. So part of it is like the analogy that's often given of pointing at the moon. You have to be careful because if you focus on the finger, you're not going to see the moon, all right? And that's easy to do, to focus on the words of what's being taught as opposed to the intention of those words. 
So that, that is a piece of it that we need to pay attention to. Now in the path of individual liberation, there are different forms of wisdom as we go through this course that we will talk about. But in this one, it best relates to a concept of appearance emptiness the emptiness of the appearance of self and other. And so we're going to take a look at that. The Buddha talked about emptiness in this context as the lack of inherent existence. So what did he mean by that? Well, inherent existence means that something exists in and of itself. It is not dependent upon any other cause or condition for its existence. And it is, in essence, permanent. It cannot be broken apart. It cannot be destroyed or anything else. It is permanent. Well, one of the arguments in India at the time of the Buddha was whether or not we had some kind of a self, and that word is used in a slightly different way than we typically look at it in the West. It had more to do with what we tend to think of as a soul. Okay, and so we have Atman and Anatman in the in the Hindu uh, language or the uh, um, Sanskrit language. So talking about the idea of a soul, but this soul, if you will, was said to be permanent. It did not change. It was there and it went on. If you became enlightened, it still existed. So it was permanent and so forth. So there was some argument about that, but. Part of the discussion as we get into the actual practice here was where exactly is this Atman? And if you can't find it, if you can't prove that it exists, then there must be an Atman, no Atman, no soul. And this was the conclusion that the Buddha reached about this. And so as we look at self, and then look at other, we go through a series of question and answers. So this is a very analytic type of meditation. Unlike shamatha, where we focused on a very specific object and we're not thinking thoughts, we're not trying to, to do anything uh, conceptual at all, this is almost the opposite of that. We're turning it on its head and it's called vipassana, special insight is the special insight has to do with wisdom and our understanding of this true nature of things. And so this emptiness, the very definition of the emptiness, and you'll hear the Dalai Lama use this phrase a lot because they refer back to these original teachings quite often in the Galupa tradition, is the lack of an inherent existence. Okay? Or you might say it is not independent or not interdependent. It is independent, okay? Would be another way to phrase that. Now, one of the practices, the way that I'm teaching this particular part of the course, uh, a lot of this comes from a small book called The Progressive Stages of Emptiness, of Meditation on Emptiness. Uh, the last time I checked this book was not in print. Uh, and it is by Kempo Tsultram Gyamatsu Rinpoche. It's also, though, the entire book is actually available on the internet. You can do a search and you can find it. Uh, so it is available out there. Uh, but it's an excellent book, a very simple book. As you can see, it's quite small. Uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of text, but it really gets to the point. And it goes through a series of five meditations on emptiness in progressive stages. And so we're going to go through those, but in this particular path, we're only going to do two of them. The first one focuses on the emptiness of self, and the second one on the emptiness of other. So from the point of view of Tibetan Buddhism, those consist of the key parts of the view of wisdom or emptiness from the point of view of the path of individual liberation. Okay? So those will be our practices here. Now, the progression in this book is described as having four parts that you go through, or four stages of understanding, if you will. Uh, the first one is going through the process of listening and studying. 
And so we're analyzing what it's talking about, trying to understand it from a very conceptual point of view. And then we reflect and contemplate on that. That kind of reinforces the aspect of cognitive learning that we have gone through in this process. The third step is to actually meditate on it. Then we let go of the cognitive aspect and let it give us a direct connection, a direct experience of what it is that it's talking about. So first we develop a cognitive understanding, we reinforce that, and then we just let go and try to connect with the direct experience of that emptiness. And then the fourth one is integrating it into our being. So we really become that. You might think of, for example, a scientist, maybe a physicist. And this physicist thinks of the world in terms of atoms. So everything they look at is thought of in terms of atoms, atomic structure and the integration of atomic physics and subatomic physics and, and so forth. They can't get away from that, okay? Or flip it around. What about an artist? An artist looking at the world in terms of colors and textures and shapes and the space between things and so forth. And everything they look at takes on that quality. Okay? So when we have expertise in a particular area, we tend to think about the world from that particular point of view. So what we're doing is really nothing different from that. We're looking at it from a particular Buddhist point of view. And so we take on this world, world view from this Buddhist perspective in the process of doing these practices. And that's why it takes a while to actually develop it. It becomes a habit. And it takes a while to develop any habit. So that's why we have to repeat these practices over and over again. And the more times that you can do it in a given day, the better off you're going to be in developing those skills. Now, the five stages of emptiness that are talked about in this Progressive Stages book are, first of all, the Shravaka stage that I mentioned before, and then the Chittamatra stage. Now, Chittamatra actually refers to the mind-only school. There turns out are two mind-only schools in Buddhism, but you'll find a lot of texts that refer to them as two phrases referring to the same thing. Technically, that's not accurate, and we'll see why as we go through this. Uh, but the Chittamatra school, as well as the uh, Yogacarya school, uh, are both referred to as mind-only schools. But the Yogacara school is also a part of the Middle Way school, or the Madhyamaka point of view. Okay, so it has a lot of similarities with Chittamatra, but it also is a middle way or Madhyamaka school. So it is actually separate from Chittamatra. So I wanted to point out that particular difference. Uh, the next division are the Madhyamaka schools. And there are three of those uh, that broke, breaks down, first of all, into two divisions. The first division is called Rangtong, and the second, Shintong. Okay, within Rangtong, there are two divisions. So these are the first two, and then we add the Shintong to that to give us the three Madhyamaka schools. And so we have Rangtong uh, Sotantrika, and then we have Rangtong Prasangika, and then we have Shintong Yogacara. Okay, so those are the three versions, and typically they're referred to just as Sotantrika, Prasangika, and Yogacara. Okay, makes it a little easier. But they're all Madhyamaka points of view. Okay, so as I mentioned, Madhyamaka means middle way. And the middle way school was developed probably, or at least heavily influenced, by Nagarjuna. So Nagarjuna is a key figure as a part of this, although we see evidence that some of this material actually developed prior to the time of him. So he was probably influenced by some of that in coming up with his ideas, but he also heavily influenced other ones that came after him. Okay? So there's a kind of a give and take, as we often see in, in these cases, but certainly he was one of the most influential of the figures involved here. So, 
the Buddha then talked about the extremes. He also talked about a middle way, the extremes of indulgence and asceticism. So when we looked at the Buddha, the life of the Buddha, that was one of the things that we first talked about. That was one of his first realizations was that the extreme of the life of a prince, or at least that's the story, whether he was an actual prince or not, we don't know for sure. But he had a very good life to start with. But he was disappointed with that. So he went through this process of several different stages, but wound up practicing this extreme asceticism for a while. But that didn't work for him either. And so he brought that together and said, there must be a more mediocre middle way of going about this process, which he engaged in and became enlightened. So that was his first discussion of what is meant by the term middle way. But later, when he was giving the second turning of the wheel and he was talking about this idea of emptiness, he also characterized it as a middle way between some of the extremes of these Indian schools and their positions about things. One of those positions had to do with everything, or at least the soul, being permanent. Okay? And another one which said, on the other end, there is absolutely nothing at all. No soul at all. And there's nothing that actually exists. Okay? It's all in your mind, which gets us to the Chittamatra point of view. But he said, it must be a middle way that doesn't really go to the extreme of permanence nor to the extreme of nihilism. There's a middle way of those. And so the idea of the middle way school is really focused on that and how that relates to this idea of emptiness. But the middle way school then is the one that gets picked up in the next path, the path of the bodhisattva. So we're not gonna go into that in any detail. I'm just trying to give you a general idea of how these things fit together. So uh, in that particular idea then, with the emptiness, uh, it's empty of any intrinsically existing nature, uh, but it's and not self-existent. But phenomena do not exist independent of other causes and conditions. Everything is dependent upon those things. So we have principles of impermanence as a part of this and dependent arising, which is basically interdependence. And so uh, they have basically the same meaning as a part of that. Now, emptiness in the Madhyamaka point of view is expressed in terms of the four extremes that Nagarjuna talked about, which he took directly from earlier teachings of the Buddha. So emptiness is not a thing. Emptiness is not no thing or nothing. Emptiness is not both. And if you think about it logically, typically when we go from emptiness is not a thing, we jump to, well, it must be nothing, nothing. But he says, no, it's not that either. Well, you say, well, maybe it's some combination of both. He says, no, it's not both either. So if it's not this, it's not that, it's not both, it must be neither. He said, no, it's not that either, <laughs> okay? You've just eliminated every logical explanation of emptiness, right? There is no logical explanation. That's why we call it transcendent wisdom. Okay? It transcends logic. It transcends the ability to put anything in, express anything as concepts. And so another expression, so when we get to the next level in the path of Tantra, we often talk about it as being like space. Now this is a metaphor, it's not an actual existence of some things. We have to be real careful because we can turn it into a thing by making it space, which it is not. But it does have a space-like quality to it in that if it's not a thing and it's not nothing, but it still exists, there's this suchness, there is kind of a space-like quality to that. And so that is often used as a metaphor in the teachings of Tantra and particularly in Dzogchen and Mahamudra as a way of trying to explain this. Now, in the Indian schools, we also have something called the two truths. We have ultimate truth and relative truth. So the ultimate truth is what we're talking about when we talk about transcendent wisdom. 
the wisdom aspect of all of these teachings is focused on this transcendent wisdom part. Relative truth basically then is everything else, but it is relative, okay? It's dependent upon the particular people, the time, the place, the circumstances, the setting, lots of other things. And so one of the things that we often talk about is the fact that there are in fact contradictions in Buddhist teachings. And the explanation of that is that the Buddha was particularly good, and we saw this in that part of the course when we were talking about the Buddha and the way he taught, he was able to connect with people where they are. Well, you may be in one place and the next person may be in a different place. To connect with them where they are, you've got to be able to explain things from that point of view. And then eventually, kind of nudge them along until they get to the place where everything it comes together is as one. And so we do have teachings because of teaching people from different points of view that tend to look like they contradict each other. But only when you really take them in context and see how they are brought together do you realize that, okay, they're just meant to really help a particular individual or a particular group or something like that. So it's important to keep that in mind as we do that. And as a result, these relative truth teachings are often referred to as being provisional. Okay? So they're within this context. They're not absolute. Now we can work ourselves into a little bit of a catch-22 here, a dilemma, a moral or ethical or better logical dilemma as we try to work with this. Because in fact, anything that we can articulate in terms of concepts can be said to be relative truth, okay? And in fact, Jay Tsongkhapa, who was the founder of the Galupa tradition, said exactly that. He said, all teachings, all dharmas are in fact relative truth. You cannot teach ultimate truth. You can teach about it. Okay? You can try to explain it in ways that are helpful to people. You can point to the moon, but you have to recognize that in fact they are not absolute. Which gets back a little bit to these different forms of Madhyamaka. He's teaching from a point of view called Prasangika, okay? rather than Shintang. And so we get some contradiction, interesting arguments, but we'll, we'll get to that later in the course. Okay? So we'll avoid t talking about that now and, and kind of complicating things, if you will. So what we're really talking about then is this direct experience of the ultimate. And that's what all of these teachings, it's what all of these practices are ultimately about. How do we get to that, that direct experience? And so what we're talking about at this level is how do we understand emptiness in terms of the idea of lack of inherent existence. And so that's what the practices are all about at this level. So let's look then at the Shravaka approach to this. Now the Buddha defined emptiness, as I have said several times, as the lack of inherent existence. So not having an independent, permanent existence or not being self-existent. The Shravaka approach then is part of the path of individual liberation. And the focus is on the emptiness of self or the emptiness of not self, other, other things other than that. So what do we mean by self? And we've talked a little bit about that. Well, in everyday life, we tend to look at this self as if it actually is, in fact, permanent. Okay? It exists, it's here today, it's going to be here tomorrow, and indefinitely. Okay? We tend, particularly in the West, to kind of deny the possibility that we're actually going to die. You know, how could that possibly happen? Uh, particularly when we're young, but uh, it is, in fact, one of the things that we need to address, and part of the tradition is recognizing that and what that is all about. In fact, it's often used as one of the motivating factors when we get to the point when we realize, yes, in fact, I recognize that I am, in fact, going to die. That can be a motivator to do the practices to realize, well, I don't know how long I am, in fact, going to live. I need to do the practices now, not wait until I'm so many years old and then I'll get around to it then if I happen to live that long. So 
we want to take, uh, pay special attention to that and the way that we tend to get rather emotionally attached to ourselves and how that then really complicates our lives. And a lot of our suffering, in fact, comes from the fact that we're so attached to ourselves and our idea of what we are or who we are and so forth. And so some of the questions that may come up as a part of this, uh, for example, if we become hurt or offended by something someone says or does, who or what exactly is feeling hurt or offended? Okay? And we can contemplate that. We can think about that question. Or who or what is it that is afraid? Or who or what is it that feels bad? Or good, flip side, both are true. Why does death seem like such a threat to many of us? It's a natural part of living and dying. Why do we feel threatened by that? Is it all in our mind? What is mind? <laughs> Bigger question. Is it the brain? Well, that's typically the point of view of Western scientists. Are mind and brain the same? In what ways are mind and self the same? Good question to ask. Are they different? And so forth. So there are lots of questions that you can generate trying to think about self, its relationship to mind, and the idea of permanence, impermanence, the relationship of that to the brain, because we tend to think of it that way often from a Western point of view. Or we might look at it from the point of view of Descartes. I think, therefore I am. Uh, but then I am is just a concept, right? The very idea of us thinking and so forth. So uh, all that we can be sure of is that we actually had an experience of a thought. Yeah. So a t-shirt once said, um, uh, I don't think much, therefore I might not be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, a little play on Descartes' words there. Uh, so when we try to find this self, when we go about this kind of a systematic analysis of this self, we find that we cannot find it. There is no, and we could dissect ourselves, take ourselves all apart. We can't find this thing that we call self. It doesn't exist in any physical way. And so it's subject to change. It's subject to these causes and conditions. And therefore, it's not permanent. And if it's not permanent, it has no inherent existence. Therefore, it is empty, lacks inherent Existence. So, so that's the basic kind of an analysis that we go through. Another example that the Buddha often used in his teachings was that of a dream, okay, as a metaphor. So he used that example in the sense that in a dream, we imagine that we have a body. We imagine that we are living in a world of things. But things happen in dreams that can be somewhat odd. We can get burned, or we can drown, we can fall, vast, falling off a cliff, or something like that. And we have these sensations, but if we wake up, we realize it was just a dream. It was just an illusion. And so he uses that analogy to say, well, when we are in this state of ignorance, of the understanding of the true nature of things, and we think of the self as being permanent, we think of things as being permanent, it's just like a dream. It's not the way things really are. I mean, you could look at it from a scientific point of view even, and say, well, this table, this table looks like a table, it looks like something solid, made out of wood, this wood at one point was a tree, but now it's this table, and, and so it's solid, and it's, it seems to have a kind of permanent existence. Now, if we came back in a few hundred years, we might discover that this table was no longer really that. It kind of fell apart, and it was discarded, maybe used for firewood or something like that. So it wasn't really permanent. But from a scientific point of view, we would look at it and say, well, this thing actually consists of atoms. Any of you see the atoms in this table? <laughs> okay. 
we can't see the atoms, but we are told by scientists that it actually consists of atoms. We know that atoms consist primarily of what? Nothing. Empty space. Yeah, they have protons and neutrons and electrons, which break down into even tinier things. But in fact, most of that consists of space. In fact, if the nucleus of an atom was the size of a softball, the electron would be 14 stories away from here. So there's a lot of space. And if you opened up that softball, that would consist mostly of empty space as well. Okay? So almost all of it consists of empty space, and yet it appears to be solid. Not solid at all. Why can't I put my hand right through it? You would think from that point of view you could go right through it. Not so easy to do, right? Well, the various forces that tend to bounce up against each other and keep that from happening, but it still is very different than the way that we look at it. Okay? Now, from a Buddhist point of view, we don't tend to look at things in terms of atoms, but we do look at things as being somewhat of an illusion. They are not, in fact, the way we tend to think of them as actually being. And so by going through this analysis, starting with an analysis of self, we begin to change our view of what self really is. And when we do that and we break that down, we stop clinging to self and the kind of problems that that creates for us tend to start melting away. Because somebody says something to us that might offend us, we're no longer offended. There's nothing to be offended. Okay? Why would we be offended with somebody saying something like that to us? Doesn't matter anymore. Okay? Now that doesn't mean that when you become enlightened, if you hit your finger with a hammer, it's not going to hurt. Although it may hurt less. There's some good research that shows that those that meditate tend to be less sensitive to pain. But it doesn't mean you're totally oblivious to pain necessarily. Okay? So we're not trying to say that, but it does in fact change both physically things as well as, and more importantly, the mental aspect of things and the way that we see the world. And so that's the really important part. If we can develop a true understanding of the nature of things, then we can move a step closer to enlightenment. And when we achieve being able to be there all the time, that's what enlightenment really is. So that's the goal. And that's what the meditations are all about doing. So, now in India, when we talk about self at the time of the Buddha, we talked about self in terms of what are called the five skandhas, or sometimes the five heaps, or the five aggregates, different names for this, but that's what we're talking about. And those five aggregates are form, referring to the body in this case, feelings, perceptions, mental constructions, and consciousnesses. Now, you'll find different words, and in some cases the words actually have slightly different meanings from different teachings, uh, but this is the one that I'm most familiar with, and so this is the one that I will use here. They're all very closely related to each other here, but I do want to point out that there are some slight differences in some cases. So you could encounter that. So the, these five things constitute what we mean by self at the time of the Buddha. That's how we understand it. If we were to look at it today, we would probably look at it in terms of biology and, and maybe some uh, organic chemistry, those kinds of things, as well as psychology and so forth. Okay? So a little bit different point of view, but if we get down to it, we can see that these constitute a pretty good classification system for what we generally think of when we talk about a self. So let's go through this just briefly. First one is form, the body, if you will, and or other things out there. For now, we'll focus on the body. Uh, but if we examine this concept of self, over and over again, uh, we get to a point where we become absolutely certain that this body has no inherent existence. And that's what we're trying to do with this analysis, is get to that point. So our body is not self. No part of our body is self. 
our hand, our leg, our head, our heart, our lungs. None of those could be classified by themselves as a cell. So you can't chop us up into little bits and find any individual part that can be classified as self. Right? And one of the definitions is the idea of partlessness. If you can subdivide it, then it's not absolutely inherently existent. Okay? So we look at the body from that point of view, and we start looking at the parts of the body and find, okay, there's no self in terms of that process, that analysis. And so we can also say, well, there's nothing out there that is our self. And so we meditate with certainty until we achieve this level of certainty that we cannot find anything that we can actually call self in that sense. That our patterns, our habitual patterns of thinking about self basically dissolve away and we achieve this direct realization. Okay? So that's the idea. Now, the same kind of pattern then with the other four skandhas. So we have feeling. Feeling refers to things like pleasure, displeasure, or even kind of neutral kinds of feelings that we might experience with an indifference. Um, and then we examine our feelings. And we take a particular feeling that we might have and we examine that. Is that self? Is this feeling or that feeling? Or can that feeling be subdivided into different parts? And so again, we begin and we go through this detailed analysis over and over again. And we find another thing about feelings is that they tend to change. Okay? One minute we're happy, another minute we're sad, another minute we're just kind of so-so, mediocre. Okay? And the fact that feelings can change, they're not permanent, so they have no inherent existence. But you have to do it over and over and over again until you have that direct experience and you just automatically realize that, yes, any and every feeling that comes up is like that. And the next one is perception. Now, perception has to do with how we see, hear, and so forth, different things. Now, Buddhism breaks up perceptions into different ways. And so you have the object of perception. You have the I, the sensory aspect of that, so for we have different perceptions, eye perceptions, ear perceptions, and so forth, and different senses, and they differentiate among each of those different parts. But we have those aspects, and then we have the recognition of that. We have an image in the brain. That image then becomes labeled, I see, a bottle of water. Okay. So we put a label on it. So there's all these different processes involved in that. Now this then gets subdivided a little bit in these next three parts of the aggregates here. So we'll look at that. So we have the perception as the sense of that through the five senses. And could include thinking, but we'll come back to that because it fits into a different category here. So seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, so forth. All of those are a part of this perception. So then we look at each of those perceptions and we think about that. Do the perceptions ever change? Do the objects that we're perceiving ever seem, tend to change? Where is this perception happening? Is the perception out there? Or is the perception in our mind? If it's in our mind, where is that? Okay, so you go through, again, this complete analysis process of anything that we might call a perception until we, again, get to that real concrete uh, state of knowing that perceptions themselves are not this self. And the next stage are the mental constructions. These are basically the thoughts and emotions. Now, we talked about emotions already, feelings already, so we can leave that out because it's in a separate category and focus then on the actual mental constructions we call thoughts. So the mental constructions of those thoughts and memories that tend to come up from the brain itself. Okay? So these are not the thoughts that come from perceptions, Th those fit together with the perception aspect, but when we think about a thought that just comes up, like a memory of something, 
or we come up with a new idea, an idea that we've not had before. Those thoughts about things that we're not seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching at the moment, those are all thoughts that are coming up from the brain in some way. Okay? So now we look at those kinds of thoughts. And even though psychologists will tell us that the, the ideas of uh, these, these personalities that we have, for example, tend to change, they're fairly stable, but they do change somewhat over time. And so that's a key. Things change. We know also from brain research that memories themselves can sometimes change apparently, except for six people that we know of that have these absolute memories that they can remember this absolute detail of anything and everything in their entire life. The six that have been identified in the world that have that capability. But if we look at those things, most of us, the actual memories and the research that's been done about what actually happened versus the memory of what happened tend to change over time, long-term research. Okay, And so, that can't be self, because those memories of things actually change. And they involve concepts, and so we start breaking them apart. We can discover that most thoughts have different pieces. So that can't be permanent or a self. Uh, it has no inherent existence. So again, we go through this and we look at all of the thoughts, the nature of thoughts coming and going. Thoughts don't last forever. In that sense, they may be stored in the brain, but they come out and they manifest so that we're actually thinking it. That's what our thought actually is. And then it goes away again. So again, it's not permanent. All of these different things that we can look at as a part of this process, and we do it over and over again until we get to the point where we're absolutely convinced that this is the case. And then consciousness. And consciousness means a moment of awareness. Okay? A moment of awareness. It can be a fairly long moment. It can be a very short moment. In either case, something that we are aware of. And so in Buddhism, we find that there are actually six consciousnesses at the base level. Uh, there may be a couple of others. There's one other, two other, or three other, depending on the particular school that you're talking about. But the basic ones include a consciousness related to each of the basic senses. So there's an eye consciousness, an ear consciousness, a nose consciousness, a, I guess you'd call it tongue or taste consciousness, and a touch consciousness. And those are five, the basic five senses that we commonly think of in the West, and then a mental consciousness, thoughts. Okay. So those are the forms of consciousness in the context of Buddhism. So we can look at each of those and analyze those forms of consciousness. What do they consist of? Are they permanent? Okay. Do they come and go? Well, we kind of defined that just by the very definition itself, a moment of consciousness, of awareness. Okay. So of course they come and go. Even in your own meditations, if you meditate on an object, a physical object, a shamatha meditation on an object, you tend not to notice sounds for the most part. If something really loud comes up, you might happen to become aware of it for a moment. But lots of th sounds going on that you simply don't even hear. You don't pay attention to them during that type of meditation. If you were doing a sound meditation on sounds, you would not notice things in your vision. Okay. So there's lots of things that we are sensing at any particular moment, and the brain actually doesn't pay much attention to most of those unless something changes. The brain is designed in such a way it's real sensitive to changes. Okay? And that's a survival thing, because when something changes, it might be dangerous to our existence. And so when something changes, it says, pay attention to this. And so a loud noise, all of a sudden, we're alert to that, and the brain alerts us to that. That's part of why we have to go through this training in the mind in order to let go of some of those kinds of normal processes in the brain, and so we don't become alerted by some other kind of a process going on. 
So we do that here in terms of consciousness. We think of that stream of consciousness, if you will, which is bound by space and time. And we look at each of those different forms of consciousness until we become, again, fully convinced that any of those are impermanent, that they don't last, that they have no inherent existence, again, as a part of that. Now, I did mention there are a couple of other forms of consciousness. Typically, they're not included in this particular analysis, uh, but they're called Vijnana consciousness. And so, in some cases, they are identified as, um, uh, well, the uh, divided consciousness is called Vijnana. Uh, each of the different moments are distinct and so forth, these different consciousness. And uh, so they also, these other forms of consciousness, I just wanted to mention briefly. So we've got alaya consciousness, which is sometimes called the storehouse consciousness, where karma is said to be stored, the seeds of karma that ripen at a different time. Some break that off, then in uh, some just use that and they say, well, ultimate consciousness and, and that are all one. Other forms break it into two parts, and so you have the uh, conscious, the alaya consciousness, which is the storehouse consciousness, and then you have a form of ultimate consciousness that is separate from that, which is the consciousness that once all the karma is exhausted, that disappears, and what remains then in the state of enlightenment is this ultimate consciousness. So that's, enduring. that's enduring. And we have to be careful about that because then there's the th other one which says, well, that then is really not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, Prasangika point of view, nothing is permanent. And so that is a concept of something. And so there's really two of those. And so one of them is basically our idea of this ultimate consciousness. And the other one is the actual ultimate in consci consciousness, but it doesn't actually exist in any form because that would be a thing and that would be, yeah, so it goes beyond that. So there's different ways, different philosophical systems. At some point it gets to be a little bit like the philosophers in the Christian tradition arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen and, and that type of thing. Um, but it's also helpful to at least know these different points of view are out there. So that then is just an overview of this idea of wisdom from the point of view of the individual path of liberation.